warm welcome to you. It's this week's edition of The Whistleblower. My name is Ian Trent and joining me is another fantastic panel of water polo personalities. First up, we have the former FINA referee and long-standing coach nationally and internationally. Good evening to Phil Bauer. Hello, Ian. Great to be with you again today. Nice to be with you too. Now, our uh, first rookie panellist is a former Australian representative. She's the most decorated Australian player ever. How good is that? A gold medalist at the Olympics, the World Championships and the World Cups. In fact, two of them. Um, no one else has done that. Also a top coach. Throw in an MBE or an OBE or whatever you've got there. <laughs> but she is awesome. a rookie. A rookie on uh, the whistleblower panel. Good evening, Deb Watson. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a bit late for me, actually. So a rookie, that's why I'm a rookie. Oh, I just wanted to put you, uh, put you, into, you know, into your perspective there. Another rookie panellist, first time for the ex-Australian junior team player and also a member of one of the great Balmain families. Welcome, Nick Falzon. Thanks, Vinny. Yeah, true to be here, mate. Ah, there you are, you've popped up. Fantastic to have you on board. Uh, soon is our special guest, Erkin Shagayev. A uh, couple of communication notes. I wonder if they're going to flick up onto the, uh, the screen. Our uh, audience questions. If you've got an audience question, look at the bottom of your screen, right? The Q&A box, give it a little tap there and you can write a question for our panel about rules, about you can talk to Erkin Shagayev about anything you like and, um, or any of the panel. And we guarantee that we'll get it on if we possibly can. Our email is uh, normally shot up onto the screen now. It's not there. Uh, our whistleblower uh, polo at gmail.com. Instagram, whistleblower polo. Hashtag who is TWB, the whistleblower. Our Facebook page, um, hashtag whistleblower. <coughs> and, of course, our YouTube page where you can watch it. Oh, there it is. Our YouTube page. <coughs> and you can see it up there. Um, and you can watch it on replay if you really want to, or tell your friends that we're on. Fantastic. Uh, and and yeah. could I just um, send out a cheerio to Scotty Swichel, who had a bad accident during the week, and that's why our technical side isn't where it should be. Well, but, I, was going uh, to, I was going to lead you into that, Phil, but now you've done it. Scotty had a nasty accident, but it's good that he's okay. Definitely is. Yeah, and we wish him all the best. It could have been a lot worse. So anyhow, all the best, mate. And uh, we're still working hard in the background for us. Now, uh, some news. Water Polo Australia announced that their national team money has come through. That is good news, Phil. Uh, yeah. Until when? Till the Tokyo Olympics and a bit after? Yeah, I think it's till June 2022, if I can remember correctly. Yeah. So it's a start to the Paris cycle. Was there, was there a bit of doubt about that or? I, I think that's where they go for up to June. So to get Tokyo in, they had to go at least till 2022, June 2022. Okay. They're all annual the grants. That's very what, Why wouldn't they go right through to 2024? Because they don't know how we're going to- the next cycle. So they might know how much money they're going to have. Mm. I, and yeah. they want to, I'm sure it's results based on the Olympics as well. Um, how about any news on the uh, Australian Water Polo League season, Phil? Have you heard anything about when, where, why, how it's going to be conducted? It's, it's very fluid, especially with the borders starting to open up. Uh, I, you know, personally, <laughs> I think we might be looking at a chance of having a close to a full National League season. That would be good. Yeah, probably just depend on what WA is going to do. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think they're going to open up. There's no, I think there'll be no problem about that. It's a matter of when. Weren't they uh, looking at a December start or a late November start? Maybe it might end up being January. What do you think? No, no, it was always going to be late January. Oh, uh, okay. that, that, was, that was agreed to, I believe. Yeah, so it was going to be late January. Uh, the only flyer, the ointment could also be the, uh, the women's side where I believe they're going into camp for a number of months. So whether their players would be... 20 players would be available. I'm not sure. Hey, Phil, do you think that will give them enough time to get themselves organised? If it, if it starts late January, that's only two months. 
Yeah, but I, uh, there was a thing that went out. They had four different scenarios, Danny, uh, you know, with the last one being just a week-long tournament. Uh, you know, the, whether they're past starting in January, I'm not quite sure. But uh, if West Australia opens up, you know, it's probably, it's now only Victoria that will be closed. And West Australia is open to Queensland, South Australia, Northern Territory and Tasmania. It's just not open at the moment to Sydney, to New South Wales. So, yeah, That'll that's a possibility, change. isn't there? Distinct possibility. Okay, we shall see what occurs. All right, now, let's have a look at refereeing. Danny Flav's there in the middle of, our, of my screen anyhow, and we say hello to him. And, of course, Danny is the leading referee in Australia. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you once again for being on here. Welcome, Deb, Nick. You're looking, Thanks, remar Danny. You're looking remarkably healthy for someone who's been out of lockdown. <laughs> well, we've just come out of lockdown. We don't have our 25K zone anymore. And you wouldn't believe it, but uh, the last two days in Melbourne has been absolutely sensational. So uh, we've uh, been able to sneak out and get a bit of sun. It's been great. Fantastic. I bet you've got stuck into a few other things as well as far as the, uh, <laughs> the beverages. Oh, couple. The beverages. Okay. <laughs> Danny, what do you got for us today? Uh, as usual, I've really been enjoying these, uh, these question and answer uh, sessions. Yeah, well, hopefully we've got a, a, a couple more uncommon um, scenarios that happen during a game. And uh, if we can get the first one up, we'll, we'll see how we go and where we go with it. Here we go. Okay. Okay, I'll just read out. So we, here we have a defensive player is excluded. While he or she is swimming towards the re-entry area, their team regained possession of the ball. So a player's been excluded. As he's swimming to the re-entry box, they've regained possession of the ball. So the player doesn't go to the re-entry area, but turns around and swims back into attack without interfering with the game. Okay, so in this situation, everyone will be wanting, well, he, he didn't go to the re-entry area. Uh, so surely he's come back into play, even though they're in, they're in attack, that it has to be a penalty because he didn't leave the field of play. Well, all it is, is just another exclusion. So that player is excluded once again. Uh, they uh, turn the ball over and they reset to 30 seconds. So it's no penalty, nothing for the game, no red card. It's just a mistake by the player who should have went out. So all he does is didn't, he's excluded again. So then he's got two, two uh, personal fouls now and he has to go back to the re-entry box, change possession, new 30 seconds. And of course, in the old days, there was a, a heap of drama and uh, penalties and uh, people yep. getting multiple, well, you still get your multiple fouls, but Yes, yeah, so he's still getting two personal. Involved. Yeah, still get two personal fouls. It just makes it a lot more easier uh, and understandable. So, you know, the player's made a mistake. But it's not, it's, you know, he hasn't interfered with the game. His team's in attack. So, yeah, it's just another exclusion. Turn the ball over and, and reset the thirty. Okay. Uh, we'll try to, the next one would be good. Okay, a white player is awarded free throw inside six meters. The ball is on seven meters. Another white player immediately puts the ball in the play and starts faking or starts balking. At that moment, a defender inside six mid area raises both hands to block the ball. Okay, what happens in this situation is, even though the foul was inside six metres and the ball's outside seven metres, the, the player puts the ball in the play. So that ball is now live. Even though the player can't shoot the ball because the foul was inside six metres and the ball was outside, uh, the ball is still live. So if a defender tries to block a pass, because that's all that can happen because a player can't shoot, and then they're inside six metres, blocks the pass with two hands, it has to be a penalty. Reason being, they're inside six metres. And any block from a pass or a shot with two hands is a penalty. If that defender was outside six metres and they blocked both hands, then it's an exclusion. But it's, it's every day of the year, if they, if they block with two hands inside six metres, it has to be a penalty. A bit of confusion because people are saying, oh, but, but he couldn't shoot anyway. It doesn't matter. Rule states from a shot or a pass inside six metres, penalty. Just a question here. Yep. If you you can raise both hands and not block the ball, is that correct? No. 
No. You can't raise both hands. No, inside six metres, it's so in front of the goals. Because if you by raising both hands, you're trying to block the ball no matter what. So, and you don't know where the attacker player is going to pass the ball. But if a defender's got his hand, both hands up inside six metres, it's a penalty. So, Danny, when do you blow the penalty? Before, as soon as he raises both hands up? As soon as he raises both hands. You don't, give him, you don't even give him the opportunity for the attacker to pass the ball or, yeah, or whatever he's going to do with it because we, don't, we, don't, we can't say what a player's going to do. But as soon as he puts the ball into play and the defender puts both hands up, we call the penalty immediately. So does the attacker need to be looking at the goals? Uh, no, because it's a pass. It doesn't matter. Because it, 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 we're assuming, which we, and which we shouldn't do, but it can't shoot anyway. So all good players know that. So it's going to be a pass no matter what. And you don't have to be looking at the goals to pass the ball. because It might be a two-on-one situation in front of goals when this happens. And um, so if I can pass to a person two-on-one, it's going to be a probable goal anyway. So as soon as they put their two hands up, we immediately pay, uh, blow, blow for a penalty. Okay, we can go for the next one. Hopefully that's uh, clear. Okay, a neutral throw was awarded. Before this, the white team was in possession of the ball. Okay, after a shot by a white player, the ball strikes an overhead obstruction. So it hits the roof, hits the wire, hits the flags. Okay, so, so when it um, strikes an overhead obstruction, um, it has to be a neutral throw, okay? So what we had was the white ball was in, the white team was in position of the ball, they had a shot, deflected, hit the roof, let's say, okay? Uh, then we had the, the referees called a neutral throw and the white team wins the ball again, okay? The position time is reset to. Like this is, this is uh, it's, a, it's a tricky one, but it's a very easy one to understand. Any neutral ball at any time, the clock has to be reset to 30. No matter who was in possession of the ball beforehand, no matter who took the shot, or no matter who, which team wins the ball after it's been thrown back into the pool by the referee. Any neutral throw, uh, is the possession time resets to 30. So I think that's it's an unusual one, but I think if we say, if, we, if people understand it, if it's a neutral throw, the clock resets to 30. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Okay, so Phil. There are three questions. Yep. Yeah, I've just got uh, one question for Danny because yeah. it's come up at a couple of states that contacted me and it's the taking of a free throw, Danny. Um, how long do you have to take the free throw once it's awarded? Okay, yeah, look, any, any free throw, the rules actually stipulate it's undue delay. That's how they put it in the rule book. But it's we've always said and it all... Um, TWC meetings we go to and all referee meetings we have in Australia and anywhere in the world, you know, the undue delay is between one, two, three seconds. Okay, so you've got, you still got between one, two and three seconds to play the ball. So you don't have to play the ball immediately. You have got that time to, to play the ball. If you don't play within that two, three seconds, well, then, it, then it's a turnover. Uh, if they don't have an immediate shot, and they hold the ball for three or you know that three second time, and then they shoot. That's a turnover because the rules stipulate immediate shot from a from a minor foul or from a free throw. Okay, so uh, and what's happening is uh, in a lot of situations now is uh, players are getting the foul, the minor foul, and they're playing the ball straight away. So in doing so, the defending player can attack them straight away. Even if they didn't get a chance to move back, if they've played the ball straight away, they can then in, uh, they can then defend the defend the player. So, if you're not going to shoot it from an immediate foul, and you hold the ball for that time, and the defender doesn't move away, there's the exclusion. So we've got to be careful that it's immediate shot. It's not immediate playing of the ball. So if we're holding that ball for those couple of seconds, and the defender doesn't move away. Easy exclusion. So okay. if the players take it upon themselves to play the ball straight away, that's their own prerogative. All right. So it's called separation, right? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yep. So sometimes, as we said, if you're not going to have the shot from immediate foul, you have that you have that time to hold the ball and look what's going on. And then then it gives the referee, sorry, then you're making the referee make a decision. 
did that defender move away or didn't they? Or have, have I held the ball too long and then I turn, I call a turnover? So, and if you played it, as I said earlier, if you played a ball straight away, you're then given the option for the defender to attack you straight away. Does that make a bit more clear? Yes, it does. And Danny, uh, uh, people have been playing around the countryside uh, for, what, two or three weeks now. Um, and I know myself uh, being an ordinary referee, very ordinary, uh, and I, I'm refereeing I'm refereeing with ordinary people. Oh, that what you meant. Hey, so we're all ordinary, <laughs> um, less than average. Uh, I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding about the penalty situation, front water, right? And all I say to anybody is, well, as far as I know, you've just, after listening to this session for a long time, you've... If the centre forward is, is turns or the player in front is turned yes. or is, has front water, as long as they're making a great attempt to go for goal, they can have a shot. Yep. If they have a shot, no problem. If they're prevented from having a, a full blast at it, well, it's a penalty. Is that right? Yep. Every day of the week. If they've got front water and they're taking the goals and trying to score a goal... That's 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 the big thing now. We want to be we want to see these players trying to score a goal. If you if you play for the penalty and not trying to score a goal, the referee cannot call a penalty in that situation. You want to be you've got to be wanting to score a goal. So it's all about facing the goals in front front water. Only the goalie to beat, trying to score a goal. And if you're holding the ball and you're grabbed, fouled, whatever, penalty straight away. Okay. But you can still have a shot. As they Absolutely, we you now they, they they encourage, or they you know good experienced referees can uh, judge what's going on and hopefully get the player to score a goal because we want to see goals scored. We don't want to see a referee uh, come in and, and call the penalty. Um, so you know a lot of people say, oh well, the referees interfere with it. Uh, but sometimes you have to. But yes, we we want to give advantage and we want to score a goal. But we've got to be smart in how we're doing it. You now if, if you if take a drowns you or hits you on the head or grabs your arm then in that situation, the best off thing to do is just call the penalty straight away. Then there's no, no confusion whatsoever. No confusion. No well, confusion. I, I beg to differ. There is confusion <laughs> there, but you've made it a little clearer for sure. <laughs> Danny, thank you. Uh, have you got anything else to add? Uh, any members of the panel? No. Okay. Come Danny. on, Nick. You've got something always to say about referees. Well, I thought he would have. <laughs> uh, no, I'll get the nod. Okay. okay. Danny, thanks for joining us, mate. Enjoy the uh, lack of lockdown. No worries. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good show. There he was, Danny Flav, with our referees segment. Uh, let's move along now to our very, very special guest. And, of course, he is the former Australian and Russian national men's team coach. And, of course, an Olympic gold medalist for the Soviet Union during their absolute glory days. We welcome to the show, Erkan Shigayev. Hi, Erkan. Uh, hello, Grant. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, lovely to see you too. Uh, all right. It's going to be a good session. We're going to talk a little bit. You, you've been a controversial uh, character in Australian water polo for the last whatever number of years, 25 years. But we're going to find out about Erkan the man and his background in this session tonight and let's kick it off with where it all started you were born in tashkent in uzbekistan now i'd say 1961 because that's that was the year um i've only seen uzbekistan on joanna lumley's television show uh the silk road or whatever it was and i've got to say uzbekistan looked beautiful Tell us a bit about the country. Yeah, first of all, I would like to uh, say that I'm pleased to see everyone and thank you for having me here at this show. Uh, secondly, I was born in 1959, not 61. Well, that's okay. Oh, thank you for that, Phil. Uh, yeah. Is that you or somebody else? Anyhow, there we go. 59. Yeah, in regard to Uzbekistan, yes, I know not many people uh, know where it was or where it is. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I remember the expression of um, Paul Keating, who was saying that uh, Australia was uh, the bottom end of the world, or some other expression was there, which was obviously a, a joke, but uh, 
a very funny one. Anyway, we uh, Australia is a beautiful country, and uh, one of the reasons uh, that I'm here is that uh, in 1985 uh, I came here for the first time and fell in love. This is a beautiful uh, country, and I'm very happy to be here and today speak to you, Trent, and to the other ones. Thank you for having me. So, Erkin, how, how did you get into playing water polo in Uzbekistan? And what was the progression of you at nine or 10 years old starting to play? And then how did you work your way into the USSR system? Well, I started uh, to do swimming classes first. Uh, two young coaches came to my school and asked who wanted to do swimming and I uh, read my arm and uh, that's how I started to do you know, swimming classes. After one year, I switched to water polo and uh, uh, since then I've been in water polo all my life. Uh, obviously, my junior team uh, was taking part in the national championships of the USSR, Soviet Union. And it was a multi-staged um, competition because of uh, a large number of uh, teams participating in it. And uh, uh, my team from Tashkent managed to make it to uh, top six, the grand final of the national uh, USSR championships uh, for this age group. And uh, uh, having taken part there, uh, I was noticed by the national coaches and uh, uh, my first international tournament for the Soviet Union was in 1975 at an international tournament in uh, Poland uh, uh, for the best uh, Eastern European, uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Bloc countries, not Eastern, uh, Eastern Bloc countries. And uh, it was Hungary, it was Soviet Union, it was uh, Cuba, it was Czechoslovakia, it was Poland uh, and other, other countries, um, Bulgaria. Now, in 1975, that was the uh, under, uh, Soviet Union under 17th team, and uh, I was 15 at the time. Uh, we won it. Uh, it was uh, a very uh, good experience for me. Uh, well, I did well, I think. And the next year, which was 1976, uh, the same tournament was held in uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. And uh, we won it again, and at that tournament, I got my first uh, international award uh, for the, uh, well, I was uh, given the award for, uh, uh, for the top goal score. So I scored more goals than anyone else at that tournament, and we won it. Uh, and uh, I was 16 uh, then, and uh, no, 17, 17. And, um, I was invited to uh, the senior USSR squad in 1976 um, at the age of 17 and a half. Uh, that was uh, immediately after the Olympic Games in Montreal. Uh, but uh, if you have questions in regard to that, I can answer them. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, Ergen, Nick here. And always good to Hi, see you. Mate, yeah, very well, thank you. Do you mind, I mean, I've spoken to you a little bit about this in, in the past, but can you talk a little bit about, to, to everyone listening tonight, about the circumstances of coming into that team in, in 76? Maybe a little bit about the, the recent history of the, the USSR team and how strongly they had performed over many years with the exception of the 76 Olympics. Uh, and so what was, the, what was the environment that you came into, in, into that team? Because obviously quite a... Well, a very, very interesting period and challenging period for the Russian, Russia or USSR team following 76. Yes, uh, water polo in the former Soviet Union was uh, having its beginnings uh, at the beginning of the previous century. You know, it started to develop before World War II, but uh, uh, good development uh, occurred after the World War II, you know, particularly. Uh, when Hungary became uh, a part of the socialist um, sphere of influence. Uh, and uh, from then on, the Soviets uh, often went uh, to Hungary, the Hungarians came to uh, the USSR. Uh, and uh, that's how, uh, you know, the knowledge and experience was developed in the Soviet Union as well, in addition to obviously their own sort of uh, mm. um, uh, developments uh, 
uh, in that sport and other sport. Anyway, uh, uh, everyone in Australia knows uh, about the Melbourne Olympic Games where the Soviet Union came third and then uh, there were uh, bronze medal at the Tokyo Olympic Games, a silver medal was won in uh, Mexico in, in 1968. And the first Olympic gold medal for the Soviet Union was won in 1972 in Munich. Uh, between 1972 and 1976, uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, was, uh, you know, dominating the uh, world stage. They won um, uh, the World Championships in 1975, and the team arrived in Montreal in 1976 with no less stars than uh, gold medal. You know, even silver would have been not what they were planning for. But unfortunately, you know, it's a different story. It's different analysis. Uh, uh, you know, some, uh, it was a disaster and uh, the team came eight from it. After that, uh, the coach was dismissed, uh, the uh, team was dismantled and then a, a new crop of uh, players was invited, among them was myself. Now I was only 17 and a half and uh, I did not get to play for the Soviet Union under 20 uh, national junior team. Uh, obviously because I was engaged to the senior team and um, uh, from then on, uh, between uh, 76 and 1980, uh, I was among 52 athletes who went through this um, meat grinder uh, mm -hmm. uh, to make the team in 1980, uh, uh, you know, 11 players who took part at the Olympic Games in Moscow. Uh, it was a very difficult period. Um, uh, in 77, that was my first official uh, international tournament, uh, that is uh, when I say official, European Championship, that was, we came fourth only in 78, uh, it was World Championships uh, in West Berlin, uh, we came fourth only. In 1979, uh, the very first World Cup uh, that was held in uh, the former Yugoslavia, we came fourth again, and uh, there were some dramas, some circumstances. Uh, but uh, by 1980, a new team emerged uh, in the Soviet Union after, you know, difficult years. And I remember how difficult it was for me. Why was it difficult? First of all, because we were coming fourth only at every major tournament. That was not what, um, you know, what was expected of the team. In 1977 at the European Championships, I felt very well. And I was, uh, even though I was uh, the youngest player there, um, I did very well, was one, one of the best. But in uh, 1978 at the World Championships, and that is my own judgment, uh, you know, I probably uh, would rank myself one of the worst in that team. Why? Because I did not feel well, you know, physically. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, when you talk about it and uh, say quickly, you know, I made Olympic Games, it uh, sounds easy, but in fact, uh, after the World Championships in 1978, uh, my chances um, to make Olympic team were very slim. I was um, transferred from uh, what would be the first uh, uh, list of the players, top list of the players, uh, what would be described as the second uh, list of the players. And uh, why that was? It because, uh, you know, I was not uh, demonstrating the game that was expected of me. And why I was not demonstrating it? Because I did not feel well. Why I did not feel well physically? Uh, well, uh, I analyzed it, uh, I thought about it for a long time, and uh, later on, particularly you know, when the sports science, uh, you know, developed uh, to new heights, and when I was myself coach, I was uh, thinking about mid-altitude training and camps for my teams, and um, uh, what happened to me, that uh, that condition when I could, I didn't have energy, uh, occurred after mid-altitude training, uh, Camp uh, with the Soviet national team in uh, uh, end of November, December uh, 1978. No, 1977. Sorry, 1977. Uh, there, yeah, we were for two weeks uh, roughly, and um, uh, it was mainly um, uh, conditioning camp where, uh, you know, among other things, we did between five to ten kilometers a day uh, swimming. And um, uh, I was very conscientious all this uh, as an athlete, as a coach in any other capacity. And uh, I was doing my utmost and, uh, you know, just at full capacity. 
and uh, uh, most likely it was not um, uh, what was uh, uh, required. Uh, there should have been probably some uh, uh, different regime, different um, intensity. And uh, unfortunately, I did not get a, a proper advice at the time uh, because, uh, you know, even though the sports science in the Soviet Union was uh, rather advanced compared to some other countries at the time, at the time, uh, mm. uh, it still was not advanced enough or, you know, not enough research was done. Um, and we did not have, have a specialist sort of uh, uh, medical officer who could have been observing me, watching, and uh, uh, also, you know, doing some uh, objective um, monitoring of my, no, system, of my body. Anyway, the bottom line that I came back from this camp and uh, we were given uh, personal tasks as to what we should be doing on our own when we were back in our flats and I was doing it conscientiously. And again, it was rather voluminous amount of additional work, additional because uh, my uh, club mates did not have to do it. I did it for myself. Yeah, Erkin, can and I just I jump in? Erkin, can I just yeah. jump in and ask you something? Uh, you said in 1976, after the Olympics, the coach was fired. Yeah. And then you had a lot of fourth places, and yeah. the the association or the, the country wasn't happy. Uh, did yeah. the coach stay in place, or did you have a different coach going forward? No, uh, the the coach that brought first gold uh, to the Soviet Union was Anatoly Brementa. He is an excellent, famous coach. And uh, he also was the one under whom the team won uh, the World Championships in 1975. He was the coach in Montreal. And um, uh, after that uh, disaster, he got dismissed. And another coach who was uh, his assistant in uh, Munich was appointed. His name is Vladimir Semenov. He was fantastic, excellent player for the Soviet Union and a very knowledgeable coach. but. Uh, because of uh, two results, uh, fourth in uh, Sweden in 1977 and fourth in uh, West Berlin uh, at the World Championships, uh, uh, he was replaced by Boris Popov. Boris Popov before that point was um, a national junior coach and they won uh, uh, twice under his uh, care the European Championships. The World Championships were not held at the time before the juniors. And uh, so he was appointed uh, in December 1978 uh, under him, the team uh, came fourth um, uh, in uh, at the world, first World Cup in Yugoslavia. And there were some controversy as to why we didn't get bronze at least. Uh, but the team started to mild, and uh, uh, in 1980, uh, and I can elaborate upon that. Uh, you know, we managed uh, to win Olympic games in Moscow. But uh, you know, if I can finish with this uh, story of myself, I think it, it should be interesting and. Uh, like uh, educational for the younger players. So anyway, that condition that occurred with me, uh, as I was, uh, as I found out later on, you know, it can last between six to eighteen months. In my case, it was eighteen months, and um, uh, I came out of it in July 1979. At the time, I was uh, like not in the first in the A group of the players uh, considered for the Olympic Games. Uh, However, as I said, I felt better. There was an international tournament and Group A uh, actually went to another tournament and uh, Group B went to a second tournament in Holland. It was also a strong big tournament, which we won. I did very well. It was one of the best, if not the best, you know, top scorer and everything. And then uh, uh, that earned me the right uh, to be included in the extended squad uh, to prepare for the Olympic Games. And, uh, you know, there were a series of camps uh, where A play, played, uh, played B and B would uh, normally beat A, uh, I was in the B. And, you know, that earned me a place in another camp uh, that was in Italy on the invitation of the Italian squad in January 1980. Uh, the team went there, we had a series of um, you know, scrimmages with the Italians and again, Group A goes and uh, Place group B goes and uh, you know the Lewis uh, good waterfall with good uh, score that earned me a place in the, in the another camp uh, which was uh, uh, culminating in a in a match against Hungary and uh, you know they did well and then uh, you know after that basically I was entrenched into the final uh, 15 18 people and by May uh, 1980 uh, I was selected into top 11 and. Uh, 
In June, there was an international tournament in Italy uh, where Italy, uh, U uh, Soviet Union, I think Hungary and uh, Holland uh, took part. Uh, we won it. Uh, I got award for, I don't know, the best play or best skills. There was this award. And uh, in 1980, it was the Olympic Games uh, tournament in Moscow, which um, uh, you know, culminated in our gold medal. Now, I must say that uh, uh, it was a strong tournament, despite uh, the I anticipate the question about uh, boycott uh, of that Olympic Games. But in the water polo tournament, it was a strong tournament. It was uh, well, Hungary attended, Soviet Union was a uh, Yugoslavia, which was uh, not like Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro, these days. It was the combined Yugoslavia, Italy, world champion, uh, Spain, uh, Holland, Cuba, they all are top sides uh, for that period of time in history. And, uh, uh, sorry, Erkin, other, yes. other than the Americans, obviously, were, were there any other water, top well, tier we, water polo nations uh, who didn't uh, play? The, uh, the American team did not come and Germany didn't come. Australia was ah. there. Yeah. Australia yep. was there. Australia, by the way, beat uh, uh, in the uh, beat Italy mm. uh, at a later stage of the tournament and uh, achieved good results. I think they came mm. second. Yeah. Uh, but Italy was in our preliminary group. It uh, yeah. was the very first match at the Olympic Games, um, and uh, we were well. I know that uh, myself. Uh, we were uh, like nervous, but not that nervous and calm. Mm. And, um, uh, we won that game 8-6. Mm -hmm. Then we had Spain in our group. Uh, we, in fact, played Spain twice so in the preliminary group and then in the final top six. Yeah. The system of um, uh, competition was different uh, to what it is now. It was more from the standpoint of um, uh, sporting principle that the best wins was better, in my opinion, because, yes, there were preliminary group. You had to make top six. In that case, uh, and then in the there you had to play round robin. So we had to play Hungary, we had to play Yugoslavia, we had to play Spain again, we had to play in Poland, and you know to achieve gold medal. Mm. Uh, obviously, the key game at the Olympic Games was against Hungary, uh, uh, which we won. And uh, if there are questions about how the game went, I can tell. Uh, but uh, mm. after achieving that result. Uh, uh, then I knew that we had a uh, good chance of getting gold. Mm -hmm. We played Yugoslavia in the, on the final day of the tournament, and uh, draw was enough for us, but we, we won it. We won it, and uh, uh, you know, we won gold medal. Erkin, who were some of the notable players that you played against in 1980? Uh, well, uh, there were many of them, uh, almost entire Hungarian team, uh, you know, I can give you a name, uh, Tamas Farago, Chapo, Horpi, Gerindash, uh, Molnar in the goals, uh, Shuda in defense, uh, uh, Istvan Sivus, uh, the famous center forward, uh, you know, almost any player was uh, a top, top brilliant player. Uh, now, that's Hungary, if we speak about Yugoslavia, you know, their better player for me was Milivoj Debić. Obviously, there was uh, Rudic playing for that team, who was um, the, one of the top players. Um, there was uh, Roy, a future uh, coach of the Croatian team. Uh, there was Mustu, Krivakapic, uh, later on he became president of the uh, Serbian water polo, um, uh, who was in the goals. Um, a very good friend of mine and um, Bob Trifonovich, who was uh, working in Australia, in Western Australia, in the 90s, you may all remember. Yes. Uh, when, we tell, uh, when we speak about Italy, you know, Demazisris, Gianni Demazisris, um, if we get to speak later on about, uh, you know, technique and uh, waterfall in general, uh, that era, uh, it was top driver. There are no places like this anymore with the technique that he employed. Uh, I, can, I can tell you, you know, how um, I saw him first time in uh, June, 1977, that was my first international tournament abroad. Uh, and uh, I looked at him and I was um, amazed what, uh, what he did and how he did. I never saw, had seen it before, anything like this. So he was captain of the Italian team. 
Now he's speaking about uh, Spain, uh, young uh, Manuel Estiarte was at this tournament. By the way, Manuel became top goal scorer uh, at the Olympic Games in 1980. So at the time he was uh, in 77, I was uh, 18, he was 17. And uh, so therefore in uh, 1980, I was 21, he was 20. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, these are the plays. Uh, future national coach of Spain, uh, uh, help me. Yane, was Juan Yane? Uh, yeah, yeah, Jane, Jane, Jane was a coach, you know, uh, was a captain there. Uh, so he was the, uh, the, you know, you name it, uh, almost everything yeah. had uh, top, top international players, so we... Yeah. So you know, can we maybe just dwell on on, on Manuel Stiarte for for a moment? Yeah. There, he's obviously you played against him. Um, yeah. You played, saw him start start his career. I'm pretty sure he was still playing when you were coaching the national team. I'm quite sure he played still for Spain in '98 at the World Championships, which we'll talk about in detail later. But yeah. maybe you could, how did he change as a player? I mean, was he still the same player? 20 years later, presumably he was able to evolve and, uh, and adjust because the sport was very different um, over that 20 year period that he played. Did you, how did, how did, how did, what are some of your observations of him having, uh, as I say, played okay. against him, coached against him? Yeah, obviously he, he was becoming better and better because he become more, more and more experienced. Mm. If I'm not mistaken, he's the only player who, in the world who took part in six Olympic games. I think so. So he finished in uh, Sydney in 2000, and his first one would have been in Moscow. Mm. And um, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm mistaken, so he played for a long time. And what amazed me, uh, how his body uh, was able, his organism was able to, to sustain the type of game he, he was playing. And this type of a game, uh, you know, because of his um, size, Mm -hmm. uh, he was not a big player at all, but he was one of the best, if not the best, at some stages of um, you know, uh, water polo history. Uh, it was uh, highly mobile, uh, very fast, uh, skillful in terms of shooting, uh, and not only forearm shooting, but any other shot. You know, I just was listening to the rules as discussed mm -hmm. now how you know the referees uh, should be giving you uh, time and space and should identify whether the player genuinely goes for a goal or just uh, tries to um, simulate the situation to earn a penalty. Uh, we can talk about it when we get to this stage, but uh, these are the traits of STR. Anyway, he, his reading of the game was obviously uh, superb and um, uh, you know, it was uh, a counter-attacking player first and foremost, but also uh, mainly because of uh, those rules uh, that existed at the time, you know, in uh, standard uh, or set attacking situation, because of his mobility, he was able to, you know, implement uh, some combinations and technical uh, 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 execution uh, that, uh, you know, make, uh, uh, was making waterfall, uh, you know, beautiful and very, very entertaining and attractive. Mm -hmm. I can say the same about um, De Magistris, you know, what he was doing as a driver, as a mobile player, mm -hmm. uh, what sort of skills he had in terms of getting inside water with or without the ball, or, you know, jumping back. And um, in fact, our game plan at the Olympic Games uh, in Moscow, when we played uh, uh, Italy, normally, normally my job, one of my jobs would have been marking plays like uh, uh, De Magistris, um, Estiarte, Farago, uh, or Jorge for that matter, or even Gerindash. But uh, uh, for that particular game plan, Bakal was uh, marking him, and his job was not to let him inside water. And whoever was in the vicinity behind um, uh, him should be guarding and watching for a sprint and then jump back uh, for um, uh, Gianni De Magistris. And, uh, you know, we've managed to uh, implement that, uh, that game plan that brought us the result that we wanted. So that, that, my, that would be my characterization of Manuel Estiarte. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I was surprised to see how, you know, at the age of 40, almost, you know, his last Olympic Games, he mm -hmm. was still, um, you know, uh, displaying, demonstrating the traits of, uh, 
you know, high mobility, high speed endurance, and uh, that was very impressive. Mm. Yeah. And All right, I've got a, I've got a question. It's all about Manuel. What about you? Like, what made you the player you are? And, and, you know, what sort of, how did you start out playing? What were your strengths? And then, you know, what direction you went into to turn you into the player that you ended up? Well, uh, because of my uh, size and I was uh, second shortest player in the Olympic team, Soviet team in 1980, uh, my height uh, is the one. Uh, 178 centimeters. Uh, Katenko was uh, smaller than I, was uh, one, 176. But I was uh, the lightest. I started the Olympic Games tournament uh, with the weight 74 kilos and I finished it with 72. And it was not water or fat that I lost. Uh, so my game uh, to deal with, uh, you know, some of the bigger players, so, you know, in that game in particular, you know, like it was then, uh, was high mobility, speed, anticipation, reading the game. Um, uh, it was a uh, mobile forward position. Now it's called driver. And your job is to, you know, uh, um, service uh, the center forwards and create opportunities um, in attack, create counterattacks. When it comes to defense, clean up after the center forwards who have to come back and you help them, you know, to slow down the break if there is break of them. Uh, sort of to put down the fire, to put down counterattack and um, clean up the mess that might be there. Um, uh, so it required, you know, high mobility, speed, speed endurance, you know, constant movement to torment, to torture your opponents, you know, with this bring, um, quick sprints all the time. So it required the uh, highest level of conditioning and, uh, uh, you know, say Olympic Games tournament in uh, Moscow was eight games. So it would have been uh, any other tournament, European Championships or um, uh, World Championships. And uh, in fact, twice uh, in particular, um, you know, by the last game in Moscow, uh, that's the analysis, you know, you think about it. Um, in the final game, we played against Yugoslavia, the game that uh, virtually decided the gold medal. I was okay. I played without, almost without replacement. Uh, but, uh, you know, I did feel that my energy levels were a bit low. Uh, maybe if at the time I got better advice about nutrition, you know, recovery techniques, uh, it was, you know, the way getting it was good. And the system that I was getting uh, good was good. But uh, later on in my life, you know, I learned some new things with the advancement and development of sports science, sports medicine. But uh, I did not feel my best, even though I was okay. And I still did the job that was required of me. Uh, the same was in um, uh, Guayaquil at the World Championships um, in Ecuador, where in the final we played Hungary. And, um, you know, I played the entire game without replacement. And I could feel that, you know, I was struggling a bit, even though, you know, no one told me to see it. But uh, uh, well, all I'm saying is that um, if I felt better, I could have done much more. No one told me to uh, what I contributed in the final score. So, uh, maybe my game was speed, agility, mobility, anticipation, reading of the game, uh, you know, uncompromising attitude. Uh, bring it back, I say. <laughs> <laughs> now, Irk and I, we're talking about 40 years ago, and, you know, you've got this uh, the perspective of, of uh, the Soviet Union being a pretty rigid sort of place. What was the level of discipline in that Soviet team relative to, say, a team of, you know, the 21st century? Well, uh, I can describe you my experiences, my uh, how it was. So, you know, I was a boy from uh, Tashkent, uh, that is the uh, capital of Uzbekistan. However, it still was almost 4,000 kilometers from Moscow. And, um, you know, to be selected to the Soviet team, uh, it was going without saying. I mean, uh, uh, I could not uh, go and uh, ask a question um, of my head coach without permission. At the same time, I knew that, um, you know, uh, the treatment I received was uh, rather fair. However, there were some political aspects, political things where, you know, we talk about, oh, uh, closely knit team, uh, coherent sort of group of uh, fantastic young men and uh, all women for that matter, if we speak about female team, you know, but the reality was that 
Uh, it was highly competitive environment. And as you can imagine, 52 people going through uh, to make a uh, top 11 to, to play at the Olympic Games was, uh, was not an, uh, an easy task. There was a time once when I wanted to go home, you know, and um, uh, because of, you know, I felt too much pressure and I, I, I was hardly uh, able to, uh, to bear. But uh, uh, the discipline, uh, you know, uh, uh, I can give you an example that when um, I went to the first uh, uh, European Championships in 1977, I observed uh, a situation and I was in the water where between our top players, two of our top players, and that was saying about, but that's an example of, uh, of one of the reasons why we did not uh, get a better place at this European Championships. In the game, what happened, uh, two Olympic gold medals from 1972, uh, and one of them did not do the right thing, which goes without saying. Yeah? Um, uh, to put it in a simple term, he did not switch when he was supposed to switch to cover for another man, for another player. And that goes without saying. And I uh, heard that, um, you know, say, John, what have you done? It's just, I'm not giving you real names. And uh, John, who did not do the right thing, just looked away and I could see that he knew what he did. And imagine that it was going on between uh, two people of uh, 30 plus years old and I was only seven, 18 years old at the time. And I was in that team, they were my idols, I was looking at them. And I looked at the coaches and had that, that situation resulted in a goal against us. Subsequently, we lost that game. And uh, I looked at the coaches, uh, you know, these, these two persons were very, very merited, you know, they were Olympic gold medalists. And uh, Semyon Vladimir was coach then. Uh, I could see from their faces that they saw everything, they heard everything. And uh, so did I and uh, almost the entire team, you know, who was near there. And uh, after that situation, when we came home, one of these uh, greatest players was withdrawn from the sport forever, never ever he came back. However, he could have helped us between um, uh, 76 and 80. That gives you an example of the level of um, um, uh, discipline, the playing discipline we talked about that existed. And uh, look, uh, as I, I started with the, uh, with the story, how you know it was highly competitive and uh, uh, you had to earn your uh, place under the sun. Uh, I did not have support from my team at the No one was coming to my room saying, oh, mate, you did well, you know, you got criticized, you know, keep going. No, not at all. Maybe because I myself was a lonely wolf. You know, I don't know. But everyone was in the same situation. Uh, you know, it does not mean that we were doing some wrong things to each other, but you had to fight, you had to make the team. And there was pressure from some older people in age, you know, and uh, maybe an experience. And, uh, you know, I just either could have... Uh, I succumbed to this, or my, uh, sometimes I had to show my teeth. And, uh, but in the game, when it came to the game, uh, you know, there were unspoken rules. You could not do anything. You have to act like a well-oiled mechanism, like a machine. And um, uh, that's what makes the team great, you know, and uh, that's what eventually the team became. And uh, uh, this is a level of discipline, and uh, it applied, uh, applied and um, at the time applied to everything else in the pool or outside the pool. You know, if you do the wrong things, uh, uh, you know, there is a consequence. And, um, but we talk about playing discipline, playing discipline. And I, yeah. think, uh, I think that's, um, uh, you know, uh, an ingredient uh, that has to exist in any team that, uh, that achieves good results, you know, one way or another. And, uh, and uh, in the end, in the end, uh, maybe because, um, uh, you know, I finished my career on, uh, on top, you know, uh, without any defeat. Uh, we became, you know, uh, comrades in arms. And, um, you know, I only had uh, very warm and good feelings towards everyone, my teammates, my coaches. But uh, Erkin, yeah. winning 1980, so you win a yeah. gold medal at home, and Debbie knows what it's like to win at home. It's just that much more... What sort of incentives did you get or awards did you get? 
Well, uh, first of all, I want to say, I'm, uh, well, when, uh, when I was uh, playing and training, you know, you never think about what you're going to get, uh, rewards uh, or anything. Obviously, you know, uh, like in any country, whether it is in Australia or in, back in the former Soviet Union, if you win, if one wins Olympic gold medal, you know, you gain prominence, you know, you become, you become famous for that matter. You know, everyone uh, knows you. So to answer your uh, question uh, honestly and truthfully, uh, yes, after I won Olympic gold medal, I was able to, uh, back in Tashkent and Uzbekistan, I, I, I received an apartment. Uh, maybe it sounds a bit uh, strange to an Australian uh, person, but uh, uh, there was a shortage of um, individual apartments, uh, you know, in this former Soviet Union. I'm not saying that people did not have them, but again, your own apartment was, um, you have to wait in a queue. And sometimes, you know, uh, when you are 21, 22, it wouldn't have been possible. So I was 21 years old and, uh, you know, I waited for one year after, you know, winning Olympic gold medal. I got married, I had, um, uh, you know, a young family and uh, my first child was born and, uh, uh, the government gave me an apartment, yes. But these days, these days you hear that in some countries if they win Olympic gold medal, I don't know, in Singapore, the very first Olympic gold medal has got $800,000, you know, uh, for example. And, uh, uh, you know, some other places, including in Australia, there are financial rewards. So that that's, uh, if that answers your question, Phil, well, that's what happened. You know, and, uh, <laughs> I can ask Debbie what she got. <laughs> Debbie, what did you get? Uh, we actually got, I think it was $12,000 each, and right. we we shared a stamp so people could lick the back of our heads. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> didn't get a unit, Deb. No, we didn't get a unit. We didn't get a unit. <laughs> yeah. That was uh, to Ishvan's yeah. horror, I must say. Remember in Barcelona, the king said he'd give every gold, every Spanish gold medalist a, um, a million dollars. And he confirmed the morning of that final against Italy that it was one million dollars each if the water wow. polo team won. So I don't know of European countries. Some some of the smaller ones where they obviously don't have maybe a huge amount of success. They they get pensions and there's some pretty good perks out there. We get fame. Yeah. Look at us. I, <laughs> did. Uh, I did not I did not get a pension, but what the system that was there, uh, I should tell you maybe briefly. Uh, you know, when I won uh, first international gold medal in 1975, uh, I received the title of uh, Master of, the, of Sport of the USSR. It was a big deal. I can, if I show you, I didn't bring it today, but a badge. It's a very impressive badge, you know, and um, it was uh, really very prestigious. So when I came back to my, uh, you know, school, uh, having this title, title a master of sport of the U.S. society was a big deal. You know, grown-up people were getting it at the time. Now, the next one was uh, in um, um, August uh, 79. Uh, that was after we won, uh, um, you know, a major international tournament. There was a next, uh, next step that was called the master of sport of the U.S. of international class. Uh, but uh, having won, when we won the Olympic gold medal in Moscow, the title was um, the final ultimate title, the top title that uh, an athlete in the former Soviet Union could get is a merited master of sport. So you have to only win Olympic gold medal or world championships um, uh, to get that title. You can't get it otherwise. Uh, and uh, in fact, the badge itself is very interesting. It was developed um, before World War II. Uh, during the uh, Stalin rule of the country, and it's very interesting batch. You know, at some stage maybe I can show it to you. Because, um, yeah. I still have it. So, so Erkan, after uh, winning gold in 1980, yeah, uh, there's a FINA Cup, no World Cup, 1981 in Long Beach, and and even though USA boycotted Moscow. They, Russia goes to Long Beach. Can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, well, you see, my uh, life in uh, the Soviet Union and the national team consisted of two periods, two cycles between 76 and 80, and then 80 to 84. 
And uh, the first cycle was extremely difficult. You know, we were coming fourth and culminated in winning Olympic gold medal. And Nicholas, um, and I think we discussed how the Americans didn't come to the Olympic Games in Moscow. Yeah. So there yeah. was a bit of a, a bit of a question mark there yeah, as to well, what would have happened if they came. Uh, that was our feel anyway. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, the World, second World Cup was held in the United States. And uh, uh, whether that's true or not, but we were told that the Americans paid uh, our government a certain amount so that the Soviet team, team could go there to, you know, to America and the tournament was held in Long Beach. Uh, maybe, you know, to show uh, that, uh, you know, if they came had come to uh, Moscow, the outcome would have been different. I don't know, you know, maybe that's not correct. But uh, yes, it was held there and uh, we went there and uh, all top teams were there. And uh, uh, well, it has to be said that we proved, we proved that uh, we were the top team. We won the World Cup, we played against America, we played against Yugoslavia, Italy, uh, not, I don't remember whether Hungary was there or not, but uh, we, we won that tournament. Uh, and then the third World Cup was held in 1983 in um, America again, in Malibu. Uh, you know, and uh, we played all the strong teams, Hungary, America, Italy, Germany, uh, Spain, and uh, we won it again, uh, which was, you know, second time we won the World Cup. Sorry, uh, 19, 1981, that was, that was your first time in, in the United States, is that, is that correct? Correct, yes, correct. Yeah, it's obviously very interesting, well, interesting is a flippant word, it, you know, it, it was a very tense time, um, obviously. How did you feel be, being in, in the United States? Um, what were your observations? Um, were you able to talk to many people, whether they be the athletes or, or other other uh, Americans? Did you, yeah, did you get an impression for, for for the country? Or, I mean, I know you'd been to Western countries before and outside of the Eastern Bloc, but not, not to America. The height of yes. capitalism or the center of capitalism as you no doubt referred to it. Yeah, at the time, uh, Phil No and other, you know, uh, people of that generation would know, you know, there was, world competition between two superpowers, the Soviet Union and the uh, United States of America. So we were coming uh, representatives of, as Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan put it, you know, uh, evil empire. We went to the citadel of uh, imperialism, you know, world imperialism or capitalism, mm. the United States. Now, uh, I personally, and we were exchanging, you know, uh, with our friends, with my friends, our teammates, you know, you know some of them. Uh, you know, how impressed we were with America, you know, what we saw. Uh, I went to capitalist countries before, like Italy and Sweden. Uh, you know, we were impressed then, I was impressed. And, uh, but uh, when we came to America, it was something, you know, I mean, the highways, uh, the, you know, uh, the way life was organized, uh, you know, the uh, buildings and the, uh, well, people were different. Yeah. Uh, however, what we discovered, maybe, you know, it's only you know, because we had limited uh, circle of um, uh, acquaintances or people with whom we could uh, uh, communicate and talk, but there were students, there were spectators, there were administrators, officials, but we discovered that we, uh, it appeared to us, it looked like this, that we knew about the Americans in America as a country more than they did about us. So, I mean, we knew like, you know, how many states were there, we knew all the major city states, and you know, people, uh, economy, and uh, history. But they, when they were asking where you come from, you know, I come from Tashkent, where the hell is that? You know, we don't know. That, you know so, that's the impression uh, we got, you know, and I got. And, but uh, other than that, I can say that the uh, United States of America is a great country. One of the greatest, if not the greatest, was one of the greatest at the time. And still, still is. Uh, so yeah. we were impressed. We were impressed with what we saw. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, by the way, on the, on the way back, when we flew from Los Angeles to uh, Washington uh, to catch a flight to Moscow, 
uh, we happened to fly in one plane with um, Edward Kennedy, uh, the then senator brother of, uh, yes. Yes. of the United States. <laughs> and uh, we, I happened to have a brief conversation with him. My English was not as good as um, you know it is now, but it was uh, it was a memorable encounter. You know, uh, yeah. he was an impressive man. I don't know whether we impressed him or not, but he looked at he looked at us with interest. You know. Yeah. Uh, did I they tell me you he, he would have you would have met many people from the evil of you know, so. No, but they. But history does say that he was a, a quite a broad thinker, so I'm sure he would have. Um, enjoyed the exchange yeah it was very interesting yeah. mm. should have been president should have been. Yes. Should have been. so can you mention you won world cup in 81 you won world cup in 83 you haven't talked about world championships in 82 yeah we went uh, to Guayaquil world championships um, uh, and that was my second world championships. Uh, at the time, they were held once in four years. Uh, you will you remember that in '78 we came fourth only in '82. Uh, uh, we managed to win it. And by the way, Australia was in our group. It was the United States, um, uh, uh, you know. And uh, that was, I think, uh, the first time we played Australia at an official tournament. Uh, they were in uh, Australia was in Moscow in 1980. But we did not get to play them, but in, uh, in Guayaquil we played them. Uh, anyway, uh, it was a smooth tournament for us until uh, the final game. Along the way, we beat Australia, we beat uh, USA, we beat Germany, West Germany. We, uh, it was a rather, rather tense game in the semi-final against Holland. Uh, we beat them by, I think, 4-2, by two goals. And I remember it was very, very, like a lot was at stake, obviously. And uh, it was a game with minimal uh, mistakes, you know, um, uh, committed by our team. And it was a rather conservative game plan because uh, the uh, Dutch athletes were all, you know, quite big, robust, um, you know, with... Uh, uh, good speed, good mobility, and uh, we just had to be very, very careful and uh, wait for their mistake and uh, mistakes. And uh, so we managed to beat them. But uh, the toughest encounter happened to be uh, against Hungary. You know what happened? We went the entire tournament, tournament very smooth. You know when we were flying. Uh, I mean, it was still not uh, that easy, but uh, you know, like uh, we went without major problems against any opponent. And Hungary, on the contrary, and we were watching, obviously, what was going on. Uh, in particular, you watch uh, Hungary, you watch Italy, you watch Yugoslavia. Mm. They, were, they were struggling, they were battling, you know, and uh, they just made it uh, to, 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 to the final. That's how it happened, at least, from what we saw. And uh, again, I already mentioned that in that game, I, I, I felt low on energy. However, again, you know, played without replacement uh, game, and it's only my feelings, my perspective. And uh, the final quarter, the fourth quarter started at eight five. We were losing, uh, but because of the way uh, you know we achieved results on the in the previous games, uh, draw was good for us. We had a much better goal difference, and uh, that was sufficient for us to achieve draw uh, to become world champions. And 8-5 down uh, last quarter, uh, uh, but we've managed to you know, reduce the deficit with about uh, 45, uh, not 45, I think uh, one minute to go. Uh, it's 8 all, and uh, that's when we scored uh, the eight goal to make it even. So the Hungarians uh, get the ball and there were two referees. One of them was a uh, field referee, was an American, uh, Bill Freddy, his name, and uh, the other one, uh, uh, I don't recall who was there, but I'll check later on. Anyway, uh, as we expected, as I would have been expecting, they got an extra man. And at the time, extra man was played, uh, I think, 45 seconds. Imagine that, to defend extra man for 45 seconds. Mm. So, and you know, the type of shooters, Farago, Horkai, Gerendash. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we had to defend. 
So pass, 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 uh, short block. The ball drops into neutral territory and any referee would tell me, you know, you get your chance in attack. Neutral territory as a rule, you know, if uh, both touch the ball, the, the call goes to the defending team. Anyway, free throw to them. Uh, I'm not saying that it was unobjective, all I'm registering. And I look at the clock, you know, it's very slow. It goes like, um, like a year, like, uh, like a week. Then again, pass, 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 shot, block, ball drops. Again, free throw to them, to Hungary. And again, pass, 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 third time, block, free throw to them. And I look at the clock, the, the clock is near, near the end of the game. So we defend and we win, we, we, we have all champions. And I look at the clock, they're passing, the clock goes, SR and comes, and uh, Gerendash takes another shot, goal. Freddy shows to the center of the field, it's a goal. Uh, well, you know, uh, my heart, my heart sinks, you know, I think, well, you know. But I knew, I knew that the game, game clock was over, finished. And, you know, uh, we talk about uh, cold war force, you know, and uh, global competition between the Soviet Union and uh, United States of America. All of a sudden, the timekeeper, and I never saw it before or after, and his name was, I think, John Felix. Felix, an American, an American man, an American timekeeper, stands and says, no goal, no goal, the Soviet woman. Anyway, what happened after that, uh, the technical uh, committee, water polo committee uh, went away for one hour. They were counseling, watching video, and they came out and said, no, there was no goal. The goal was scored after uh, the game was over. USSR world champion. Well, that's an interesting story about, uh, you know, that world championships, how it happened for us. Uh, about the emotions and feelings that went through your mind, you know, over the one year, when, one, uh, one hour that you wait for the outcome of the decision, and that's how it was. That's how we won uh, the World Championships. And uh, I think another story is that uh, uh, one more gold medal uh, to make a full complement, full com complex, you know, was. Uh, European Championships in 1983 that was held in Rome. Uh, and again, you know, Italy was host nation and uh, Hungary was there, all the other big nations were there. And uh, uh, that is where an interesting episode happened, uh, you know, after the match against Italy, that was the host team. And uh, Italy was, you know, with all due respect to them, they were pumping up, uh, pumping up the atmosphere. You know, we would beat, we would win this uh, European Championships. We would beat, uh, they called us Russians or Soviets. And, uh, but, you know, the game went our way. And in particular, Kabanov in that particular game was really on fire. He scored uh, several brilliant goals. Uh, I remember that. Uh, but after the game, after the game, we were standing under the stands and the, uh, you know, Italian public, Tifosi, started to throw at us uh, objects, you know, like you tell me, you know, tomatoes, I don't know, apple, uh, little coins. And uh, so we had to be escorted by Carabinieri, you know, Carabinieri, the yeah. special police. So we were escorted to the bus and then we were escorted to our residence and the next morning we flew out. And, uh, so that was an interesting situation, and uh, but uh, you know, um, uh, uh, also a memorable one. I mean, so uh, that's yeah. the story. That's the statistical, you know, how it was. Well, Erkin, we could discuss water polo with you and your life in the sport all night. That's pretty obvious, but we haven't done half of what we wanted to do tonight. So we are going to do something a little bit out of the ordinary for the show. We're going to come back next week and do Urban Shigayev Part 2. And I'm really looking forward to that. But we've run out of time. It's been an absolute delight hearing about your history. And we'll talk to you next week. Okay. Well, I apologise if, if I was too focused. On, uh, no, that's okay. That's what, no, that's what we're here yeah, for. But but we'll do it next week. You get a double go where everybody else only gets a single. But to our panel, uh, Danny, who's 
uh, now just oh, there he is. He's popped up. Danny, Phil, Debbie, Nick, once again, Irkin, thank you guys, uh, Scotty, and of course, Noel in pre production. Uh, next show, the next whistleblower will be on Monday, November 9. That is next Monday. It'll be Irkin Shigayev part two. So that, don't mean, miss it. Does that, does, that mean, does that mean Debbie and I get to come back next week as well, or do you get two new new guest panellists to, uh, to, to interrogate you, Irkin? You'll have to talk to your, your buddy in the middle there. No, everyone's, com everyone's coming back. Terrific. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> All right. So next Monday, all right, not in a fortnight, next Monday, Irkin Shigayev Part 2. That has been The Whistleblower. Thanks for joining us. You can always catch a replay of the program on our um, Facebook page. Please do. And you'll be up to date. And then you can catch up to the rest of Irkin next week. And I've just got a little inkling that Irkin may have a couple of good things to say that uh, we'll all appreciate. But I've, I've been fascinated by tonight's uh, segment with the former Australian and Russian men's team coach. Thanks for joining us. This has been The Whistleblower. <laughs>